Hello, I'm Chris Gopper of Alien Rabbit and you've uh, fallen onto our page. We're a publisher based in the UK, publishing fiction. And today I've got a very special treat for everybody. I'm going to be reading The Silent Engineer, which is coming out in paperback soon. Uh, this is mostly just for people who maybe can't access... Uh, Mostly for yeah, mostly for people who can't access the Amazon link for the book, basically, and anybody who's just curious about um, contemporary fiction from myself, Chris Godber, who is a contemporary author. So I'm going to be reading the Silent Engineer, which is the first story in the Maximo uh, diptych. Now, diptych is a just a two books that interlock basically, uh, two novellas that interlock. So The Silent Engineer and The Eternal Ship are uh, two books that interlock uh, to form one basically. Essentially it's two novellas uh, which is, because I mean this is a primarily a tale about heartbreak to be honest, because uh, I'm heartbroken about everything that's going on in the world at the minute really. So. It's good to write about that, to try and... Because there's other people who feel the same way, so... Anyway, I'm going to just carry on reading, read the story. The Silent Engineer, a novella by Chris Godber. For my granddad, Cecil Jones, the wisest engineer I've ever known and been proud to call my grandfather... Where were you born? On a battlefield. No, no. In what state were you born? In a state of innocence. Catch 22 by Joseph Heller. Chapter 1. Howl in Moscow. Max Ozinov came screaming into the world on a bitterly cold Moscow night on the evening of the 15th of December 2013 in one of the few remaining Soviet-era apartment blocks on the outer rim of the Ovstansky district overlooking the exhibitions of achievements of national economy. Now lying in rot after decay after years of economic depression and a recession that had reduced the former Russian Federation to a wasteland. As had so often been the case in the history of their mother Russia, their leaders had misguided them and corruption had reigned free with the struggling working class of Russia paying the price for their hubris. At least now there was a prolonged ceasefire in place which seemed to be hailing old wounds between the Federation and the Eastern Hemisphere. But the economy was only slowly recovering. Did they deserve it? Well, that was a question for the philosophers, of whom Vanya Zinov was one. Oh, look at his beautiful golden locks. His mother looked down at him for the first time and smiled, as Maximo's father beamed with pride, shuffling over from his chair on the other side of the room. Dressed in a shabby overcoat and with a long black beard that went down beyond his belly button. Hello, my son. I'm sure you'll go on to do great things. He smiled, looking down with love as his wife, Maria, cradled their newborn in her arms and rocked him back and forth. Isn't he a wonder, Vanya? I'm sure you'll be a great, great man. Oh, my little boy. Oh, my, Maximo. He has your eyes, I think, Maria, smiled Vanya, sitting at their side. I think he may have your hair, though, my little mad Max, chuckled Maria, smirking as her husband who had a veritable bird's nest atop his head and who was also rather mad in his own way. They both burst into warm laughter together in the half-lit room as the elderly midwife came back in and smiled. Congratulations to you both. I must be off now, but please call me if there are any problems with him. Thank you, Yulia. We both cannot thank you enough for your help bringing our little man to this world. And with the way the economy is, oh, thank you for your kindness. Vanya said, smiling at the elderly lady. Not a problem. We have to stick together in such tough times, my friends. And with that, the midwife smiled pushed the heavy steel door of their flat and went out into the cold, dark and unforgiving night to return home.
It was the year 2055 and Maximo was now 15 years old. A wisp of a moustache had begun to sprout upon his adolescent face and he would finally soon be graduating from a secondary school. He stood in the playground of a school with his friend uh, Matvey Petrovich and smoked a cigarette. Man, what I'd do to escape this shit all. Matvey took a long drag of a cigarette. Ten years of school. I still don't know what I want to do with my life. Max looked at the trees swaying in the autumnal night. The red glow of streetlights giving the park a spiritual undercurrent as the two friends wasted their penultimate hours of school break away on day- daydreaming. You're lucky, Max. You have intelligence. Matvey looked at his friend with stern but friendly eyes. You can make something of yourself here, or maybe beyond. Who knows? But me? I'm stuck in this shell forever. What makes you say that, Matvey? Your grades are not so bad, and you're good at art and Russian like me. Come off it, Max. We both know that painting in Russia isn't going to get us anywhere. Maybe in a different time, maybe in a different place. But we weren't born in the early 20th century. We were born in the middle of the 21st after a war. Well, that's all over now. And we have to start to build again. To build again, the government is going to need artists, surely. Don't you think? What use is a society without artists? Society needs artists. I cannot remember where I read it exactly, but I did read somewhere recently that artists tell a lie to tell the truth. Matt Bay shrugged as he stepped up from the poorly maintained swing set they were sitting on. I don't know, Max. Matt Bay suddenly grinned mischievously. I've got something for us if you want to give it a try. I'd say I'm ready at least. Stocky Matt Bay's smirk got even wider as he dug into his wallet and held aloft in his hand a clump of black market marijuana he'd managed to get delivered to his rich father's mailbox from a drug dealer on the dark net. Fuck, man. You know what the penalty for smoking that shit can be? You can get ten years in a labour camp if the police catch you. Yeah, I do, but fuck it. Yeah. Fuck it. You only live once. And with that, the two friends lit up and inhaled deeply the fumes of their magical narcotic, billowing smoke through the luminous red leaves of autumnal Moscow at 11.32 at night and laughing through the cold winter's night. Max began to see the world in a new light as he and Matt Vey began laughing uncontrollably in the midnight dark. It's going to be alright, isn't it, Matt? Maxima was staring at a tree, the bark of which now began to look like it was moving somehow, pulsating in and out as his senses became enhanced from the two spliffs they had inhaled earlier. Yeah, of course it will, but you just make sure you get out there and use your brains, man. You have the gift, Max. You know numbers. You know about culture, art, poetry. Me? I can play football badly and the piano even worse. It's a technical support factory for me, for sure. That doesn't so, so, sound so bad, Matt. You can even become a programmer in these places of it if you work hard enough. Matt Vey looked down on the ground and sank into the leaves, melting into the ground. You are too much of a dreamer, Max. You have to get your head out of the clouds. Get yourself an education. One of us at least has to make something of ourselves. Max felt like he was floating into the cosmos as he flew to the moon to escape from streets that inhibited him. I will help you, my brother. I can give you lessons. Hope you get better at maths. Russian. Teach you about the great poets. Pushkin. Yesenin. All of them. Max felt he was floating to the moon in the cosmos above as he whispered to his friend below. How can we make money for that, Maximo? We need a plan. We could sell this stuff as a side gig in the meantime. It gives us a bit of pocket money at least, then. Who gets hurt? Max suddenly snapped back into the chilly reality of the rusty park they sat in. No one, Matt Faye, but what if we get caught? What are we going to do then? You know the police are still harsh with sentencing when it comes to narcotics. Even if it does little damage to people in the long run, it's a huge risk to take on. Matt Faye took another drag on the spliff before him. I suppose you're right, as all, Max, as always. And the two friends spent the rest of the evening staring at the moon glowing bone white in the evening dark as they dreamed of a better tomorrow and time disappeared. 
Where were you last night, Max? We expect you back by 11pm at least. Maximo strode into his parents' apartment block with a slightly frazzled look upon his face, wearing his thick overcoat and looking like he needed a nap as he shivered from the cold. I was out of Mount Favour, Dad. We were discussing the future. You drank vodka? And Vanya looked at his son's face with a look of slight annoyance. No? What makes you say that, Dad? Because I know that look. Vanya chuckled to himself at his desk as he surveyed the morning's essays open on his computer. He had to mark them before his shift began at the local college. He was doing them slightly late, as always. Nothing that caused me to lose so many brain cells, Dad. Get back to your students' work. Where's Mum? Oh, she's out there, where she always is. Tending the potatoes in your yard, her yard as usual. Go and say hello. Max walked through their small apartment into the small communal yard outside to greet his mum as she worked to the vegetable patch she called her second home. She smiled as her head popped up from behind some of the vines she was growing. Ah, Max. Good morning to you. How are you this afternoon morning? She beamed. Quite fine, Mum. I was just coming to say hello. Is everything well? She looked at Max with a sudden brow of concern. Have you drawn up a plan for what you want to do now, now that school is almost done with? Well, I would like to do something artistic, Mum. But I know. Uh, I know it's not a realistic way to make money with the way the economy is. I'm not sure. Maybe write. I'm good at writing, so maybe it makes sense. What do you think? Max's mother looked at her son standing there still half-baked with his scruffy hair and wispy moustache and smiled. You are half-mad like your father, so it could make some sense. Is that what you want? I think so. I don't know. I'm not sure what I really want. Max sat down at the bench near his mother. Then write it down, Max. Oh, you philosopher, she giggled. So caught up in your own pondering as to, to be blind to the world sometimes. Max smiled and left his mum to her potatoes as she, as he left for the room, walking through the early morning chill to figure out what he could do with his life. What fate shall I pursue? What meaning can I create for myself? Max sat down at this wooden desk and stared at a framed photograph of Dostoevsky in a pen and pad of it, preparing to scribble down his plan. He began to write. I am Maximo Zunov. I like to write, paint, write poetry when I can and explore what it is that makes us human. He paused a second, staring at Dostoevsky's eyes, which looked somehow distant but deep in contemplative thought. So what? We've all grappled with these profound questions. What of money? How am I to make my living in this world? I must make a living after all. Max looked around his room for some clues to himself. His attention was suddenly drawn to a painting he had done earlier that year of an imagined character. A tall, handsome man with a beard stood tall, painted with bored expressionist brushstrokes in the foreground and an impressionist loose rendering of the background behind him, a sky that glowed red and amber. He stared at his collection of books on his bookcase. Within it was an eclectic mix of fiction, philosophy, old comic books, medical texts and scientific manuals. Maybe there isn't room in this world for someone like me. He sighed in naive defeat. Suddenly his cheap second-hand digital tablet from the nearby district market started to buzz. Wonder what that so this could be, as Max opened up the old device. A black market Sony model that had been illegally imported from the US and which he had traded in earlier that month for a collection of raid books on constructivism in Soviet art his father had given him as a present on his 12th birthday. The notification glue white on the red black background of the dusty old tablet and read New newspaper open for business in North Moscow. The Morning Siren is a new newspaper which aims to bring the best in contemporary journalism to the masses. News for the people. By the people. We are looking for aspiring writers and journalists to write columns. Please send us a cover letter, a CV and a portfolio of some works to be considered. Hmm, Max thought to himself. Chapter 2. The Morning Siren Matvey was wandering around the late night streets of Moscow as dusk began to draw in and the sun went to rest. He lit his spliff and drew it into his lungs before sitting down on a concrete bench. It was the last week of the autumn term and the winter would be their last, so he thought they should once again enjoy it whilst they could. Time to give Max a call again, he thought, before powering up his headset and requesting Max for a voice activation. Max, it's Matvey. 
Come and meet me up near the VDNKH park. I have something to tell you. Okay, Matt Vey, give me about 20 minutes. I have just a little research to do. My dad has pressured me a lot at the minute on my next course of action after school. I'll be over as soon as possible. Share your location I'll come and meet you. That's fine. See you then, Max. Mark Faye walked around some more and looked at the old Soviet park around him. Walking around the central pavilion and looking at that old communist uncle. Lenin still somehow standing there after all these years. There was the usual mix of tourists and Russians milling about, but it was 10pm so the crowds that usually gathered here around here were dispersed. Far from here. Matt Faye felt a little safer that than he would usually to partake in narcotics in public, yet still a certain paranoia lingered in the back of his mind. Maybe I got myself into something too, a little too deep this time. Am I really destined to be that same hooligan of old? The old hooligan poet? He had been reading a sermon. Matt Vey, hey, is that you? A dark and distant figure in a tatty old overcoat shouted from afar. Max, at last! You're a little later than you said you would be, aren't you? Come over here and keep in the shadows. I have something to tell you, but I want to make sure there aren't any police nearby. What? What the fuck you get us to meet here, then? Max sounded a slight annoyed, slightly annoyed at his friend as he grimaced in the dimly lit square. Relax, no one can see us, but that old beard is communist, aren't I? Matt Vey began laughing. You are high again, aren't you, damn? Max's eyes rolled back at his friend in annoyance. I am indeed, Max. But come here, let me tell you something. Okay, hit it with me, you crazy fucker. Max smiled in amusement at his friend's predictability. So Max, how do you feel again about making some extra money whilst we look around for something more permanent? I got involved with some real people. My friend was talking about real money. Something we could use to get out of here. There isn't anything left for us here now anyway. What sort of money are you talking about, Matt Vey? You know it's dangerous enough having that shit on you as it is. What are you getting involved in here? Take a drag on this first, motherfucker. Maximo laughed and Matt Vey extended his hand to give him the spliff load of a skunk freshly smuggled from in from Holland. Ah, heavy shit. Max coughed as he exhaled the heavy drag he had taken. Holy shit, man, that is strong. Look, man, I'm honest with you. You know that. Well, shit. I know this man from the computer factory my dad manages around. He says he needs some gas to start spreading this around the neighbourhood. Merely moonlight and work, you hear? He gives us the addresses, so we drop it. He'll pay per drop. Sounds good, doesn't it? And that's not the best part. He'll pay 2,000 rubles per night for each successful batch of rip drop-offs. Max suddenly sat down on the bench nearby. Damn, Matt Vey, I'm not sure about this. Sounds like a bad idea to me. Muddy regardless. Suddenly a siren began to blare from the road nearby and the blue and red lights flashed in the dark. It was the police. Shit! Matt Vey shouted. Let's get the fuck out of here. I thought your headset comms were encrypted, man. Fuck. Run. Run. Max jumped up suddenly though it felt to him like it took monumental effort this time. But it was too late and the two teenagers were surrounded by two burly policemen who shouted at them to stop. Pointing their flashlights into their stone faces whilst Matt Vey made a quick run for it. But Max Max felt like he was glued to the ground, as if some force was holding him still as the policemen approached him. Matt Vey already having ran far away as Max felt a tornado of anxiety raging around him. A vortex or black hole was suddenly opening up in the park as Max's eyes widened and he froze. I can smell it on you, one of the officers said glaring at Max. Definitely narcotics, said the other. You're coming with us to the station. Don't fucking complain or try and run. Your friends is going to be in a lot more trouble than you. Of that we can guarantee. And Max was driven off to his local police station. Maria stormed into the police station with a face of angry fung and so red that it probably turned Karl Marx himself blue with fear. Where is he? Where is my son? She slammed her fist down on the police reception desk. Stunning the dumpy middle-aged woman who was half asleep in her chair. The police receptionist suddenly started waking up and booted up her terminal. Identity, please, madame. Maria took out the card from her purse and angrily passed it to the weary receptionist who scanned it quickly. Looking back to her brightly lit terminal screen which shone with a light blue hue, reflected back in her aviator glasses. Your son has been held overnight on an narcotics charge. 
This is a very serious defense and we will arrange for you to speak with an officer tomorrow. Tomorrow, I want to ring his deck night now. Maria fumed as Vanya entered the police station behind her with a brow of worry etched heavy on his head. What's going on? He said as he was bundled into the police station. Max lay down in the cell, which was now his new home for the time being, fidgeting anxiously. How the hell did I end up in this situation? I can't believe Mantevea has caught me up in the mess. Max stared at the neutral tone grey wall in front of him and felt a compulsion to smack his head on it. A certain call of the void, as the French call it. It was 10am in the morning the following day after his arrest and suddenly there was a knock on the door. Maxime knows an of. Officer Alexei will see you now if you'll post a last interview and questioning. Do not cause us any trouble. A gruff male voice sounded from behind the cell door. Fine, I just want to get out of this mess, came the response from Max. He just stood up and walked towards the heavy steel door, which opened slowly. Two officers were present, escorted into a small interview room down the corridor. Maxime Ozonev, I am Officer Alexei and I will be conducting your interview today. I assume you understand the reason for your arrest last night. Of course, but I've done nothing wrong, Max protested. You have caught under the influence of the narcotic called marijuana, which is an illegal controlled substance. Alexei responded back blank, bluntly as he paced around him. Max looked back at Alexei from his chair with a blank and disengaged her. Now let's move on to where we go from here. You were caught, not caught with drugs in your possession, so we're not going to, you're going to let you off with a warning. But there is a price. And what would that be, officer? We need you to tell us where you got the drugs from and who gave it to you. As there was another young man seen on the scene who managed to escape, who we know contacts you from your headset data. Though it seems his contact used some sort of software to mask his identity. We need you to tell us everything you know. Failure to do this will result in a breach of your release conditions and we will be forced, we will be forced to send you to a juvenile rehabilitation centre for six months. Do you understand? Max just nodded to the officer who started recording the entire exchange in a video system which suddenly came down from the ceiling. Okay, Max, everything you say from this point onwards will be recorded and archived as official record. So please first tell me everything you know about the man who supplied you with the narcotics. Max shifted uncomfortably in his chair. And what will happen to him? It depends, the sort of response was cold and blunt. He's just a teenager like me, and besides, who did we hurt? Who got hurt? No crime was committed, if you ask me. Max, this is not philosophy or the debating society. This is the law. Alexei, who was a stocky bearded man, looked down at Max with a look of slight annoyance. Ah, so that's how it is. Because of the law. It's the law. How close-minded. How ridiculous. Max tensed up a minute and swallowed nervously as he decided to make an impossible choice between loyalty to his friend or ruining his future. I will not give you his name. You may as well organise my time in the juvenile detention centre now. Alexei sighed in defeat. Why are you protecting this man? You will lose your chances of an education in the near future. Your parents will be very upset. Please, Max, if we can help you out of this mess, just give us his name. And what sort of a man might I become if I start my manhood by selling out a friend? Max suddenly started to get angry as his voice rose in anger. This bullshit! Nothing ever changes in this goddamn country. If you do not give us any information, I will be forced to recommend to the court that you get six months. Are you absolutely sure that you do not want to give us his name? Positive, Max said as he looked down at the ground and saw his future slipping away from him as if sand in an hourglass. Sinking into the ground, he felt lost. And so it was as Max was sentenced to six months at a juvenile rehabilitation centre on the outskirts of Moscow. And all out of some sense of honour to his friend, who had unwillingly ruined his adolescence. His time at the rehabilitation centre was not as bad as he had feared it might have been. He got involved in a few fights with some violent offenders where he was forced to defend himself. But he found a newfound strength to look out for himself as well as becoming a mentor to others taking the time to study, write and paint as frequently as possible with them. My time here is almost done now, and I cannot for certain say what I've learned or what I was supposed to learn. I still feel that my sentence was unfair, and I still have doubts as to why our government insists on making such a harmless substance illegal, but you have to deal with the world as it is, not as you want it to be. My parents have been crushed by what has happened, 
My dad seems a lot more understanding, however, than my mother, probably because he went through a period of heavy drinking in his 20s. Life can be tough. We all look for an escape. My sentence is due to be up next week and I intend to look for work as a freelance writer. I have had plenty of time to practice my craft whilst here, so I feel despite my minor criminal record, I should be able to find a position somewhere, possibly writing for a newspaper. As for Matt Bay, I have heard nothing from him, which I find slightly annoying, but I'm sure he's just keeping his head down low so as to avoid the heat. Despite him being the one to get me into this mess, I bear him no ill will and I hope he goes on to make something of himself. Max closed his diary and slipped it back into his bookcase. Time to sleep, dream and wait. And I think I'll leave that one for here. That's already 26 minutes. That is the first two chapters of The Silent Engineer. I'll do a third one um, next week. It just takes a lot out of me reading it sometimes. Uh, have you enjoyed this reading? Uh, yeah. Peace on that. Peace and love, I guess. I guess, or peace and love, really. All right, leave it.